phone records, financial and location data, prism, tempora, X key score, boundless informant. Hey, I'll Scott Horton here for offnow.org. Now here's the deal. Due to the Snowden revelations, we have a great opportunity for a short period of time to get some real rollback of the national surveillance state. Now, they're already trying to tire us by introducing fake reforms in the Congress. And the courts, they betrayed their sworn oaths to the Constitution and Bill of Rights again and again and can in no way be trusted to stop the abuses for us. We've got to do it ourselves. How? We nullify it at the state level. It's still not easy. The Off Now project of the 10th Amendment Center has gotten off to a great start. I mean it. There's real reason to be optimistic here. They've gotten their model legislation introduced all over the place. In state after state, I've lost count, more than a dozen. You're always wondering, yeah, but what can we do? Here's something, something important, something that can work if we do the work. Get started cutting off the NSA support in your state. Go to offnow.org. All right, guys, welcome back to the show. I'm Scott Horton. It's my show, The Scott Horton Show. And I think I got some good news here, man. I'm just glued to Laura Rosen's Twitter feed. She's there reporting from Switzerland. Uh, says that they're going to give a press conference at 7 o'clock Swiss time tonight, which is, I don't know when, um, in another hour and a half maybe? Uh, something like that. I'm, I'm trying to guess my time zones. Uh, London is five hours ahead of New York, so whatever. Anyway, um, I also got Gareth Porter on the line, and uh, he's got a source on the Iranian side. Says the same thing. They're going to give a joint statement tonight, uh, but the way Gareth puts it, on substantial progress, major understandings, but unresolved issues. His latest piece at MiddleEastEye.net is called Iran Demands Lifting of Sanctions for Irreversible Moves. Now, uh, says Insider, and again on the Iranian side, uh, Gareth, please break it down. What is the dang deal, man? <laughs> well, uh, the, the latest uh, that, that I got just this morning about an hour or, or so ago is that, yes, there will be a statement tonight. Uh, it, it will do what this political framework, the supposed political framework, quote-unquote, was supposed to do, except that <laughs> there won't be uh, the announcement of an agreement per se. Uh, you know, there, there's, not a, there's not an agreement on all the issues that's going to be made clear. So, uh, so this is ultimately still going to go down as a failure of the talks, at least insofar as the original aim was concerned. Um, I mean, I think that that is the right way to read it. So they changed it from a framework agreement to a framework understanding, huh? Is that right? Well, I mean, it's going to be a joint statement of here's here's what we've uh, uh, agreed to so far in principle. Uh, you know, we've made a lot of progress. We have major understandings, but there's still these uh, issues, which I assume will be identified uh, that have eluded uh, agreement between the two sides. But now, is that really different than the goal going into this? Because I thought that pretty much they were going to only put out a two- or three-page, or, or maybe not put it out, but uh, agree to a two- to three-page sort of outline, and then the final nitty-gritty details were still going to be put off to July all along, no? Well, I think there's there's one, perhaps you could say there's an ambiguity about one of the aspects of the so-called political framework which is whether it would in fact uh, reflect uh, agreement on all issues in substance or not. Um, I would have thought that a political framework would assume that all the key issues have in fact been agreed to with only technical, uh, technical matters still to be uh, decided or, or to, de to be determined. Mm -hmm. um, and so, I mean, that, that's, that's the, um, the main point about it, but I also think that, uh, you know, the, the difference, be, you know, the main thing is that, um, that there w was not going to be uh, what they anticipated, what the United States wanted, let me put it that way, what the United States wanted very badly was that this uh, political framework would include details of what had been agreed to uh, in quantitative terms by the Iranians on limitations on their nuclear program. I don't think they're going to get anything close to that. I think that the, the Iranians are, are not going to give them numbers uh, that they can take back to Congress. And of course, they can tell Congress whatever they want, but it's not going to be in a formal statement. 
that they've agreed to X number of centrifuges, uh, a, a, a specific timetable for the drawdown of their low enriched uranium stockpile, uh, a, a timetable for redesigning the Iraq nuclear reactor with the following specifications, et cetera, et cetera. Mm-hmm. I don't think they're going to get that kind of detail at all. Uh, and I think that's a, uh, that's a, a loss in, in terms of the Obama administration's aims. Right. Okay. Now, so in other words, they've really dumbed down their goals here in order to be able to declare victory, but, or, you know, uh, uh, yeah, I don't even know if they will victory. declare victory in any sense at all. I think that they will declare, uh, you know, that we have reached, uh, substantive agreement on a lot of things. So it's like another victory on the level of the interim deal that they scored back in uh, November of 2013. That right, we're, but, we're know, winning. We haven't won yet, <laughs> but we are getting things done here. That's the best that they're going to be able to uh, But of course, if you look at the political context uh, over the last several days in particular, and you see that the uh, Obama administration has stepped up what they consider to be diplomatic political pressure on Iran in various ways, and, and I include in that not just the statement by Josh Ernest on the 31st that, you know, we're, uh, if, if the uh, Iranians don't agree, this is not exact wording, but the substance of it was if the Iranians don't agree to our terms, uh, to our demands, then uh, we will have to, <clears throat> we'll have to take other uh, steps. We'll have to take other measures. Yeah. And that same day, I would point out, in the Washington Post, <clears throat> the court uh, journalist of, of uh, whatever administration happens to be in power, but particularly Democratic administration, David Ignatius of the Washington Post, mm-hmm. had a column in which he talked about the fact that Obama, within days of reaching the Oval Office, approved a cyber attack against Iran, a cyber offensive against Iran, and then made the uh, you know, rather uh, you know, uh, obvious uh, implication, or, you know, uh, the obvious hint, shall we say, that uh, that that the Iranians, uh, who knows what the Iranians may find in their uh, cyber mailbox uh, if they don't uh, reach agreement. Yeah, and uh, then this sick day. freak, the uh, Secretary of Defense, said, hey, even if we get a deal, all options remain on the table. <laughs> what? Yeah, right. So that's not exactly on on message. I would have said, but anyway. Uh, so, now, so well, actually, let me ask the, you. But wait, wait, on that on that particular point, is he off message there, trying to undermine the president's diplomacy here, or well, this is it, under, it, it certainly undermines the diplomacy if you say it doesn't matter what the Iranians do, we, we will still have the same options on the table. I mean, yeah. But do you think he was talking out of school when he said that? I have no idea what was going on there. I don't have any answer to you on that. Uh, that's a good question. I ain't like this guy. All right. Well, so, <laughs> so tell me about. Um, uh, well, let's get to the sanctions side of it uh, in a minute. But on the Iranian side and what all they must agree to, et cetera. Do you think that even after the deal, uh, the secondary interim deal, or whatever the hell we want to call the thing that they're going to announce today, that this still leaves room for plenty of room for failure before July? Or, I mean, I'm, tr- I'm trying to think, I mean, you know me, Absolutely. I'm sorry for I being think, an optimist. You know, but... I mean, if, if, you take, if you take my source at his word, then the Iranians have not gone along with the, the key uh, demand by the United States and its allies, which is that they must agree to allow the architecture of sanctions to remain in place. I'm sorry, I'm skipping to the sanctions issue, but well, this okay. is absolutely central mm-hmm. to, to answer your question. They have to agree to leave the sanctions architecture in place for the entire duration, at least of the initial 10 years of this agreement, and possibly beyond. And, and uh, part of the mechanism that the United States is demanding will be included in the uh, agreement is that the IAEA would have to give a clean bill of health to Iran, not just on the PMD, not, not just, uh, you know, having the, the Iranians provide the information that that uh, would would uh, induce our friend uh, Yuki Amano to say yes we we agree that you are your your uh, uh, program was always peaceful and you never had any intention of, of having nuclear weapons and you didn't have a covert nuclear weapons program but also that that uh, that Amano would certify 
that uh, Iran's uh, has has absolutely no um, other uh, other nuclear material or nuclear sites, and that its program is entirely peaceful based on. Uh, an exhaustive examination of everything, which could take 10 years or longer, and, and that's the problem. For the okay. Well, I see a silver lining in that, though, which is that they've agreed to, to cooperate on anything real. It's only the uh, the make-believe stuff that still remains outstanding on their side. But I'm sorry, we got to take this break. We'll be right back with the heroic Gareth Porter in just a sec, y'all. Hey, I'm Scott Horton here for the Future of Freedom, the monthly journal of the Future Freedom Foundation at fff.org slash subscribe. Since 1989, FFF has been pushing an uncompromising moral and economic case for peace, individual liberty, and free markets. Sign up now for the Future Freedom, featuring founder and president Jacob Horenberger, as well as Sheldon Richmond, James Bovard, Anthony Gregory, Wendy McElroy, and many more. It's just $25 a year for the print edition, 15 per year to read it online. That's fff.org slash subscribe. And tell them Scott sent you. All right, guys, welcome back. I'm talking with the great Gareth Porter about the Iran talks. They're going to have an announcement here that they've come to some form of a framework agreement of this, that, the other thing. Something short of total failure uh, and and quite a bit short of victory as well um, on the Iran talks. But I guess I'll take it. Now, a couple of points to clarify here. When Gareth says PMD, that's the possible military dimensions, a.k.a. the alleged studies a.k.a. a bunch of ridiculous, already debunked by Gareth Porter years ago, Israeli forgeries pretending to expose an Iranian nuclear weapons program that never existed, as per his great book, Manufactured Crisis, Why the Israelis Are Lying to You All Day About Iran's Nuclear Program, or something like that. I always forget the subtitle. Um, that's the one thing. And then, But secondly, you're saying, so the what the Iranians, the, the sticking point on the Iranian side is that um, or you know, part of the problem here is that they'll have to prove a negative in such a way. Never mind that they've proved the negative four or five times a year, every year uh, for uh, more than a decade now, with the IAEA continuing to verify the non-diversion of declared nuclear material in Iran, which is all of it. Um, but that, and and not even you're saying it's not even good enough that they'll put the PMD issue to bed that they're going to have to take as much as 10 years to turn over every boulder in Iran to make sure that there's not a secret uranium enrichment factory That's beneath it. it. That's it, exactly. That's what I was told by my source, and uh, it, it does jibe with, with what I've read uh, from various uh, sources about the U.S. negotiating position, that they, in fact, intend to uh, justify, that they have justified keeping the sanctions in place by saying that it's necessary... Uh, to ensure not just that Iran carries out all of the, uh, you know, explicit uh, parts of the agreement that they that they've taken on the commitments under the agreement, but that the, uh, the IAEA has been able to verify that their declarations are complete and accurate, uh, just as they did in the case of South Africa, which uh, I understand took well over ten years, and that is what really bothers the Iranians, and they're certainly not going to agree to that. And then I have to say that, you know, to me, this is the, you know, the great mystery about the U.S. negotiating position is why they are sticking to such an extreme position. And my answer to that is quite simple and very political, and it is that I believe that the Obama administration thinks that's the only way that they can keep, uh, potentially at least, the swing voters in the Senate uh, hawkish Democrats and Republicans who have not gone all the way over to the dark side uh, and completely, you know, just agreed to do whatever uh, APAC says to do. Uh, for example, Senator Corker, chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee, uh, have to keep these, those people on board. In order to do that, they feel they have to take this position. That's the only way I can explain it. I may be wrong, but but that's the only way I can explain it. Yeah. Well, and speaking of which... Um, we all know there's no such thing as the rule of law in America whatsoever. And when the DOJ announces they're going to prosecute a senator for corruption, it's just politics. Never mind the fact that uh, Menendez is, of course, corrupt. He's a senator. Uh, right. That's the same thing, corrupt and senator. But uh, looks like, would you agree that at least the appearance is that Obama has decided to get the worst Democratic senator out of the way on this issue by sicking the DOJ on him? 
Well, I would take that for granted, sure. I mean, absolutely. You'd be naive I love that, to believe man. otherwise. Yeah. I think that's just great. And and he was really like the kingpin of the Democrats on uh, the Republican side on the sanctions issue in the Congress, right? Yeah, and, and you know, I mean, I it, it could be that, I mean, this... This situation now, it seems to me, poses a very hard decision uh, on the Obama administration. I think they have to obviously reevaluate their strategy. They believed that the Iranians would give way, as I've said, uh, you know, I think a number of times on your show. Uh, they they wrongly believed that they had a stranglehold on the Iranians because of the sanctions, because of the terrible state of the Iranian economy. Um, and that they would ultimately swallow these very uh, harsh uh, conditions that they've imposed on the uh, the question of the lifting of sanctions, which uh, you know I think would make it virtually impossible for Iran to justify this uh, in in terms of taking it back home right. uh, to to the Iranian modulus, among other things. So uh, I, I think that. That's sort of their uh, House of Lords or whatever they're right. Yeah, they, yeah. They, I mean, I think the, the Obama administration now has to really ask itself, what is the worst uh, scenario here? Is it the chance that, the, uh, the, that the, uh, they, they will not be able to veto uh, congressional legislation because the uh, majority will be greater than two-thirds, or two, two-thirds or greater, because the swing vote will not stay with them? Or uh, is it that the Iranians will go ahead and refuse uh, to to uh, uh, go along with this, and uh, the talks will fail, and then uh, there'll be certainty of of uh, congressional action, and uh, and it, and and then they stand to be blamed uh, for the failure. Uh, at least that would be one uh, serious argument to be considered by the administration at this point. Right. And and to be blamed for the failure means that. Automatically, the sanctions regime, the international sanctions regime, is finished uh, immediately. Right. Well, and see, that's the thing, right? Is this is why the Iranians don't have to bend? Is because the EU and and UN sanctions are basically going to be up. I mean, America's even given all of our Asian allies exemptions uh, so that they can go ahead and import Iranian oil anyway, because they well, insisted. Well, they've given them par- they've given a partial exemption, meaning that that they can uh, they can still. Uh, import some oil, but at a much lesser uh, uh, level than than they had before. So, I so see. it's, uh, it's but a mixed they, bag. But the know. U.S. Congress, super majority, uh, veto proof majority or not, they can't dictate to the rest of the world that they have to continue to abide by these sanctions. And especially if it's so obvious that it's America's fault that the thing fell apart because of their unreasonable demands. Correct. Well, I mean, I, I think there's. I have to say, there's some ambiguity about this in terms of. I mean, they can't they can't dictate uh, sanctions uh, in a technical sense that are EU sanctions or UN sanctions. Uh, they, they can't dictate to countries that they must uh, continue to carry them out after they've been uh, broken broken down or, or gotten rid of. Uh, but but there is this residual power that the U.S. Treasury Department has to attack uh, uh, attach. Um, uh, Conditions. Well, I shouldn't say conditions. That they can accuse foreign banks and business entities of doing business with Iran, violating U.S. sanctions, even uh, you know on a trumped-up basis. And and more importantly, even you know if the there, there's no technical basis for accusing a bank or or another business entity of violating sanctions, there's a great fear on the part of these business entities and banks of of going ahead of 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 going ahead with business after having observed sanctions uh simply on the grounds that that they just don't they're uncertain they don't know really what the situation is and and they say you know basically they'd better not do anything under those circumstances so uh so so there's a there's a serious problem here that extends well beyond the the law uh, which the Iranians have apparently uh, uh, just decided that they can't do anything about it at this point. They're going to have to live with it, and and they will settle uh, essentially for the uh, the suspension of the sanctions on the U.S. side and lifting of sanctions uh, permanently when they uh, that is lifting of of U.N. and E.U. sanctions permanently uh, when they perform uh, the 
the irre- what they call irreversible moves uh, that they assume responsibility for under the agreement. Mm-hmm. And that's that's really the sticking point. Uh, uh, pri- you know, that's the main sticking point on the sanctions issue. That's what the United States has refused to to agree to. Right. And now, so can you break down for us a little bit about just how much of these sanctions Obama can suspend or, in effect, repeal by himself and how much cooperation he needs from the Congress? And I know that there are also additional sanctions that the Congress is is threatening to do, but it, at least I read one thing that said that Netanyahu pissed off the Congressional Black Caucus so much that there's no way they're going to get a veto-proof majority in the House anyway, but... um I had not seen that. That's very interesting. Uh, w- when was that published? I, I didn't see it. Uh, I'd call it a week ago or so. Okay, okay, yeah. that's a good that's a good uh, catch, uh, and, and I will look that up. Uh, but just in terms of of the president's power here, I mean, what he can do uh, in the case of, I, I believe, all of the congressional sanctions, uh, regardless of whether they're nuclear sanctions or otherwise is that he can uh, use the national security waiver in each case to uh, essentially continue the or, or to uh, 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 to waive the sanctions I should say to waive the sanctions so that uh, the the Iranians can take advantage of uh, the the economic opportunities that are available uh, that would otherwise be taken away by the sanctions uh, and and that uh, has to be done uh, depending on the exact legislation. It, it varies, I believe, from one from one piece of legislation to another. Uh, what, every 180 days, if if uh, I, I believe that's the the general uh, rule. Uh, some of them might be uh, a little bit more than that, but but generally it's 180 days. So twice a year he has to uh, take formal action to waive those sanctions under the national security waiver. And, and as long as he can do that, as long as long as the president is committed to doing that, and that will be part of the agreement, of course, uh, the Iranians are satisfied that they can that the agreement can be carried out. Uh, of course, if if Congress does uh, take you know use the ultimate nuclear weapon, if you will, on this issue and pass legislation which removes the presidential waiver on all sanctions, then. You know, all bets are off. I mean, right. that, that, there's just no deal. There's no possibility. Yeah, but, you know, the you know. politics, I mean, I don't know. Obviously, all of D.C. is Israeli-occupied territory at this point. I wouldn't even doubt if they have moles on the National Security Council. But then again, I mean, it seems like with the announcement today of whatever they call it, pseudo-victory, somewhat progress kind of thing, doesn't that really shift the politics toward the president that, like, hey, Congress, we're working on a pretty much de facto peace deal here, and I'm the president, and you're the Congress, and it's time for you to sit back and shut up and, and let me handle well, this Well, that, right that's now. the argument that I've made in the past, and I think that's absolutely correct, that um, you know, as long as the president can, in fact, uh, you know, veto and uh, and not have it overridden by Congress by a two-thirds majority, then, um, then, then it does indeed uh, mean that the president has the ultimate hand in this and this should this today's news should make it more possible for him to do that right well i don't know if it makes it more possible but it's still but it doesn't remove it certainly yet at least at this point i think that that he's still in position to go ahead with that strategy uh and let me add one more point that's relevant on on what we've just been discussing and that is that the iranians are also insisting that the agreement must include a uh, a, a provision that explicitly defines what a UN Security Council resolution would say, and as well as the timing of of the resolution. And of course, what that means is that that the resolution must uh, provide that the um, uh, the the sanctions, uh, uh, you know, that that have been removed uh, under the agreement. Uh, Will will uh, not be reimposed um, unless Iran violates the agreement, and that, uh, that this is uh, now an international legal commitment undertaken by the parties, meaning that a new president of the United States cannot, you know, violate this, cannot tear up the agreement or change the agreement in any way, shape, or form without violating international law, and that this must be passed by the UN Security Council. Uh, by January 21st, 
2017, <laughs> meaning before the Jeb. new president uh, uh, takes office. Right. Man. All right. Well, thanks very much for your time again on the show, Gareth. I sure appreciate having you around. My pleasure. Thanks very much, Scott. All right, y'all. That's the great Gareth Porter. He's at Middle East Eye. His latest is Iran Demands Lifting of Sanctions for Irreversible Moves, and the book is Manufactured Crisis. The Iranians never were making nuclear weapons. Quit lying. We'll be right back. In America today, teachers, cops, judges, and other so-called public servants make far more than the average taxpayer. And their pensions? Well, if the people knew, they'd join us. That's where you come in. Taxpayers United of America is embarking on a great new project to train activists how to take on the parasites in your communities. The entire process, from prying loose the facts to disseminating the truth to the people. The next of these great workshops is Saturday, April 11th in Las Vegas. It's just $15. For more information, go to taxpayersunited.org slash govpensions. Hey, all Scott Horton here for Liberty.me, the social network and community-based publishing platform for the Liberty Minded. Liberty.me combines the best of social media technology all in one place and features classes, discussions, guides, events, publishing, podcasts, and so much more. And Jeffrey Tucker and I are starting a new monthly show at Liberty.me, Eye on the Empire. It's just 4 bucks a month if you use promo code SCOTT when you sign up. And hey, once you do, add me as a friend on there at scotthorton.liberty.me. Be free. Liberty.me. Hey, all Scott here. If you're like me, you need coffee. Lots of it. And you probably prefer it taste good, too. Well, let me tell you about Darren's Coffee Company at darrenscoffee.com. Darren Marion is a natural entrepreneur who decided to leave his corporate job and strike out on his own, making great coffee. And Darren's Coffee is now delivering right to your door. Darren gets his beans direct from farmers around the world. All specialty, premium grade, with no filler. Hey, the man just wants everyone to have a chance to taste this great coffee. Darren'sCoffee.com. Use promo code SCOTT and you get free shipping. Darren'sCoffee.com. 